Welcome to the Smart Cards video tutorial on the GED Mathematical Reasoning Practice Test. This tutorial is a review of the material on the test and it's going to give you an idea of what you should be studying for as well as what you can expect when you take the test. So let's go ahead and get started. A painter rented a wallpaper steamer at 9 a.m. and returned it at 4 p.m. He paid a total of $28.84. What was the rental cost per hour? Let's look at the signals in this problem. Signals in a math problem is everything that's important or information that we need to know to solve the problem. Whereas everything else in the problem is considered noise and we can just disregard that information. In this problem, there are two signals, the 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. rental time, which was seven hours, and the total paid, which was $28.84. To find the solution to this problem, we simply divide the total paid, which is $28.84, by the number of hours that he rented the wallpaper steamer, which was seven hours, and we're going to get an average of $4.12 as the rental cost per hour. That would give us answer option C. What is the value of 36x minus 8y squared when x is 3 and y is equal to negative 6? To solve this problem, we simply do substitutions. Wherever we see x, we're going to put 3, and wherever we see y, we're going to put a negative 6, and then we're going to use our order of operation to solve this problem. So when we look at it, we're going to get 36 times 3 minus 8 times a negative 6 to the second power. Our order of operation says that we can multiply 3 times 36 to get 108, but before we multiply 8 times negative 6, we have to raise the negative 6 to the second power. When we do that, we're going to get 36. We go from 108 minus 8 times 36 to 108 minus 288, and that's going to give us negative 180, which would be answer option B. Annie is planning a business meeting for her company. She has a budget of $1,325 for renting a meeting room at a local hotel and providing lunch. She expects 26 people to attend the meeting. The cost of renting the meeting room is $270, which inequality shows how to find the amount X Annie can spend on lunch for each person. Let's first look at less than, less than or equal to, greater than, or greater than or equal to. Less than means exactly that, strictly less than. Less than or equal to means not more than. Greater than means more than, whereas greater than or equal to means at least as much. So as we're interpreting inequalities, let's try to put them in language that we can understand. Let's look at the signals in this problem. Remember, in a math problem, Signals are information that's important, whereas everything else is just noise and we can disregard it. In this problem, there are four signals. The $1,325 budget that Annie has for the room rental and the lunch. The fixed fee of $270 for the room rental. The 26 people that she's inviting for lunch. And the X amount of dollars that we have to find that she can spend per person for lunch. Per person in this case means multiplication. The solution for this problem would be the room rental plus the lunch should be no more than $1,325, less than or equal to $1,325. When we put the information together, we're going to get the following. The $270 fixed fee that she has for the room rental plus the 26 times X, 26 people times X amount of dollars for lunch should be less than or equal to $1,325, which is her budget for the meeting as well as for lunch. That would give us answer option B. Dominic earns $285 per week plus an 8% commission rate on all his sales. If Dominic sells $4,213 worth of merchandise in one week, how much will his total earnings for the week be? Let's look at the signals in this problem. There are three signals. 
fixed earnings of $285. We have variable earnings, which is 8% of his sales. And we have how much he sold in a week, which would be $4,213. Let's calculate the solution. The solution is going to be composed of his total earnings, which would equal his fixed earnings plus his variable earnings. His fixed earnings, he gets $285, regardless of whether he makes sales or not, plus his variable earnings, which would be 8% of the $4,213. Let's pause for a moment. In the problem, you see 8% with the percent symbol. We do not compute with a percent symbol. The percent symbol is simply shorthand notation for the reader to see that that number 8 is actually a percent. To compute with percents, we must convert a percent to either a fraction or a decimal. In this problem, 8% was com computed to a decimal as 0 0.08. Continuing on, we're going to take the $285 and add on 0 0.08 times $4,213. Our order of operations says that we must first multiply 0 .08 times $4,213, then we add it on to the $285, which would give us his total earnings for the week, which would be $622.04, which would be option D. The scientist plots the data for tree two on a coordinate grid. She begins by plotting data for year three and year 11. What are the locations of the two points on the coordinated grid? We simply plot the points by looking at the intersections between each year and the trunk diameter. As you can see by the two flashing points on the grid, where year three intersects with the trunk diameter, which is 12 inches, and where year 11 intersects with its trunk diameter, which is 14.4 inches. The scientist creates an equation that models her data for each tree so that she can predict the diameter in the future. Complete a linear equation that fits the data for tree 1, where x is the year and y is the trunk diameter in inches. Here's the equation of a line formula that we're going to use to model this data. Here are the four signals in this problem. We need to know the slope. We need to randomly select two points. And the two points that we've randomly selected are year five with a 19.8 inch trunk diameter and year nine with a 21 inch trunk diameter. All of this information is coming from tree one. The solution is as follows. We take the information from the two points that we've randomly selected. We populate them into the slope and we get a slope of 0 0.30. We take the random information that we've selected and we populate that information into equa the equation of a line formula. We're going to get the following. Y minus 19.8 equals 0 0.30 times X minus 5. All of this is coming from the equation of a line formula from above. From this point, it's just algebra to place this formula in the form of the point slope form. We do so by multiplying the slope times x minus 5 to get y minus 19.8 equals 0.30x minus 1.5. We then add 19.8 to both sides. And then when we do the subtraction with 1.5, we're going to get in point slope form y is equal to 0.30x plus 18.3. This is the model that she can use to predict trunk diameter in the future. In year 13, the scientist will put tree wrap around tree one to protect it from the winter snow. The height of the wrap needs to be 45 inches. The wrap is priced by the square foot. To the nearest square foot, how many square feet of wrap does she need? Here are the five signals in this problem. We need the year 13 diameter, which is 22.2 inches. We're going to convert that diameter to a radius, which is 11.1 .1 inches. We're going to use half of the surface area of a cone formula, 
which is SA or surface area equals 2 times pi times the radius times the height. We need to know the height of the wrap, which is 45 inches. And we need the conversion factor square inches and square feet equals 144 square inches. Here's the solution to this problem. SA or surface area equals 2 pi RH and we're going to substitute the radius with 11.1 .1, and we're going to substitute the height of, a, of the wrap with 45. We're going to substitute pi with 3.14 and then we're going to multiply it all together. We're going to get, come up with a final solution of 3136.86 square inches. The units of measurement is squared inches. However, the problem is asking for the units of measurement to be in square feet. So we need a conversion factor to convert square inches to square feet. That's where bullet number five above comes into play. So we're going to take 3,136.86 square inches and divide that by 144 square inches. And that's going to give us approximately 22 square feet which is answer option A. The graph shows the level of ibuprofen, Y units, in a patient's bloodstream X hours after the ibuprofen was taken. The level of ibuprofen in the patient's bloodstream increased from what hours to what hours. Let's look at the four signals in this problem. We need to know the time, which is the horizontal axis or X axis, we need to know the level of ibuprofen, which is the vertical axis or y-axis. We need to look at the data in the graph, and we need to determine the time frame of the increase. Let's look at the solution. From zero hours to almost an hour later, the ibuprofen levels are increasing. After about an hour, the levels decrease. So our final answer will be the level of ibuprofen in the patient's bloodstream increased from zero hours to two-thirds hours. An office uses paper drinking cups in the shape of a cone with the dimensions as shown. To the nearest tenth of a cubic inch, what is the volume of each drinking cup? Let's look at the four signals in this problem. We need to know the volume of a cone formula, which is V equals pi times the radius squared times the height, all divided by three, we are given the diameter, which is 2 and 3 quarters of an inch, or 2.75 inches. We're going to take that diameter and convert it to a radius by dividing by 2, which will give us 1.375 inches. And we need to know the height of the cone, which is 4 inches. Let's look at the solution. We're going to take the volume formula, and we're going to replace the radius with 1.375. We're going to replace the height, h, with 4 inches and we're going to replace pi with 3.14. Before we multiply everything together, we're going to take 1.375 and square it, then we're going to multiply it by 3.14, then we're going to multiply it by 4, then we're going to divide it by 3, and we're going to get 7.91 inches cubed, or answer option B. There are S steps from the pedestal to the head of the Statue of Liberty. The number of steps in the Washington Monument is 27 less than six times the number of steps in the Statue of Liberty. Which expression represents the number of steps in the Washington Monument in terms of S? Let's look at the two signals in this problem. The Statue of Liberty is S steps from the pedestal to the head. The Washington Monument is six times S minus 27 steps, more or less than the Statue of Liberty. So we get a final solution of 6S minus 27, or answer option C. Want a hard copy of this tutorial? Send an email to smartcardsquestions at yahoo.com and we'll send you a downloadable copy of this tutorial. It's going to have all of the step-by-step -step instructions that you saw in the tutorial, as well as a little more information. Start your GED test journey today with smart cards. Good luck and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.